What's up, party people, and welcome back to another episode of NYC Foodways, your weekly food and culture discussion from the cultural capital of the world. My name is John, and this week's episode is dedicated to the life and legacy of director Satoshi Kon, taken from us far too soon, whose films Perfect Blue and Paprika we will examine in future segments of our Filmways series. Is there a cause you believe in so fully as to risk dying for it? This week on NYC Foodways, we continue our study of the works of George Orwell, turning the page to homage to Catalonia, his account of time spent in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. This book takes place about eight years after the events of Down and Out in Paris and London. In the intervening time, Orwell has gotten married and established himself professionally as a teacher and journalist. He traveled to Spain in December 1936 with, in his words, some notion of writing newspaper articles, but I had joined the militia almost immediately because at that time and in that atmosphere, it seemed the only conceivable thing to do. Think about that. One day, you're a white collar worker paid to write about the lived experience of others. Sound familiar? And the next you've taken up arms, ready and willing to die for a cause far from your homeland, but near to your heart. In your heart, actually. How natural it all seemed then, Orwell writes, about joining the militia. How remote and improbable now. Revolution, and the war that comes with it, had broken out in Spain in July of 1936 after years of political instability and crisis, a coup attempt by right-wing military leaders against the leftist coalition government known as a Popular Front split the country in two with the insurgent, fascist-led nationalists on one side and the Republicans, everyone else including an enormous contingent of revolutionaries in Catalonia, on the other. Orwell arrived in Barcelona and saw this. When one came straight from England, the aspect of Barcelona was something startling and overwhelming. It was the first time that I had ever been in a town where the working class was in the saddle. Practically every building of any size had been seized by the workers and was draped with red flags or with the red and black flag of the anarchists. Every wall was scrawled with the hammer and sickle and with the initials of the revolutionary parties. Almost every church had been gutted. Every shop and cafe had an inscription saying that it had been collectivized. And it was the aspect of the crowds that was the queerest thing of all. In outward appearance, it was a town in which the wealthy classes had practically ceased to exist. The Democratic Party could never. He continues, There was much in it that I did not understand. In some ways I did not even like it, but I recognized it immediately as a state of affairs worth fighting for. This is such a compelling statement, as I'm sure I'm not the only one here who craves a state of affairs worth fighting for. Above all, there was a belief in the revolution and the future, a feeling of having suddenly emerged into an era of equality and freedom. Human beings were trying to behave as human beings and not cogs in the capitalist machine. And it is into this future Orwell rushes headlong. Militias such as the one he joined had been raised by the various trade unions and political parties. Each was essentially a political organization owing allegiance to its party as much as to the central government. Orwell joined the militia of the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification, a small, far-left socialist party. The militia was undisciplined, shabbily dressed, poorly equipped, and essentially untrained, but Orwell was struck by his comrades' largeness of spirit. Upon being integrated into the militia, Orwell makes some amusing observations about the Spaniards' maddening unpunctuality and lack of northern time neurosis. There were some other unique aspects of the militia system as well. The essential point of the system was social equality between officers and men, Orwell writes. Everyone from general to private drew the same pay, ate the same food, wore the same clothes, and mingled on terms of complete equality. In theory, at any rate, each militia was a democracy and not a hierarchy. It was understood that orders had to be obeyed, but it was also understood that when you gave an order, you gave it as comrade to comrade and not as superior to inferior. They had attempted to produce within the militias a sort of temporary working model of the classless society. Of course, there was not perfect equality, but there was a nearer approach to it than I had ever seen or than I would have ever thought conceivable in time of war. 
there's something powerful here. And it's powerful enough to keep Orwell grounded, well, physically at least, during his months in the trenches, literally, as he suffers numerous deprivations, the worst of which was the cold. In trench warfare, five things are important, Orwell writes. Firewood, food, tobacco, candles, and the enemy. In the winter on the Zaragoza front, they were important in that order, with the enemy a bad last. How's that for an introduction to war? Here's another gem. In stationary warfare, there are three things that all soldiers long for. A battle, more cigarettes, and a week's leave. Prose so crisp, it practically crunches. There are two narratives that Orwell, a master describer, well, describes at length in this book. The first, blessedly, is the unspooling of his personal wartime experience. This topic is clear-eyed, concise, and engrossing, perhaps Orwell at his nonfiction best. The second, unfortunately, is the unspooling of the general political situation in Spain preceding and during his time there. This topic, and I almost hesitate to say it, is boring, straight up. It's boring even to me, a devotee of Orwell, a super fan of Amish to Catalonia, and a student of the Spanish Civil War, who has read extensively on the subject, including an 800-page biography of one of the anarchist heroes of the war. It's boring. Even Orwell knows it's boring. He writes that, It is a horrible thing to have to enter into the detail of inter-party polemics. It is like diving into a cesspool. It's also essential to understanding why Orwell is experiencing what he's experiencing. But it's what he experiences that interests me, and fortunately, there's plenty of that to go around. Homage to Catalonia, just like Down and Out in Paris and London, perhaps this is a hallmark of Orwell's books, is eminently quotable. His spare, powerful prose delivers enormously despite, or perhaps because of its brevity. He really is a master of minimalism, and I found myself jotting down quote after quote after quote while rereading this book. Everything he describes appears in vivid detail in the mind's eye upon reading it, and because he's describing something so fascinating, the first true battle between the forces of fascism and those who would oppose them. Everything he depicts takes on heavy, almost mythic significance. Let's keep going. Weeks into his time at the front, Orwell finally sees combat. We'll join him here mid-battle. Orwell's group has just stormed a fascist position in horrid conditions, and the enemy has regrouped and is attempting a counterattack on their location. He and a small band of troops, some already wounded, are attempting to defend it. The enemy, in much greater numbers, is closing in on them. When the fascists are about 20 yards away and firing upon him, Orwell throws a grenade at them. He writes, By one of those strokes of luck that happen about once in a year, I had managed to drop the bomb almost exactly where the rifle had flashed. There was the roar of the explosion and then, instantly, a diabolical outcry of screams and groans. Consider that for a moment. Think about the luckiest thing or what you consider to be the luckiest thing to have happened to you in the past year and apply that to a literally life or death situation for dozens of people. Such bravery. One of the top officers for Orwell's battalion went missing during the attack and the commander, a Belgian Jew by the name of Cop, it should be noted, asked for volunteers to go look for him. Orwell raised his hand to do so, of course. To call Orwell self-effacing and homage to Catalonia is to call Wu's wonton king a pretty good restaurant. The man describes an incapacitating injury that required him to convalesce in a hospital and keep his arm in a sling for some time after, simply as a poisoned hand. He describes his life-saving grenade toss as a stroke of luck, and he describes in detail what it is like to be shot through the neck by a fascist sniper. I'll let you read that one yourself. It's the best part of the book. So now I'll ask you again, is there a cause you believe in so fully as to risk dying for it? I mean that question seriously, and I hope you take the time to consider it. It's one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves. Unfortunately for Orwell, as his time on the front wears on, the cause he believed in so fully ends up not quite delivering him the struggle he yearned for. When we went on leave, I had been 115 days in the line, Orwell writes, and at that time this period seemed to me to have been one of the most futile of my whole life. I had joined the militia in order to fight against fascism, and as yet I had scarcely fought at all, had merely existed as a sort of passive object, object doing nothing in return for my rations except to suffer from cold and lack of sleep. It wasn't a total loss, though. He continues, Many of the normal motives of civilized life, snobbishness, money-grubbing, fear of the boss, etc., had simply ceased to exist. Of course, such a state of affairs could not last. It was simply a temporary and local phase in an enormous game that is being played over the whole surface of the earth. But it lasted long enough to have its effect upon anyone who experienced it, one realized afterwards that one had been in contact with something strange and valuable. Many ex-hippies, or those of us that have been involved in real grassroots activism, will speak of the power, 
felt mainly in the heart that striving, really striving, fighting for a more just future can bring to those willing to put themselves on the line for something greater. After months in the trenches, Orwell is granted leave and returns to a changed Barcelona. While there, he dealt with the kind of detail that is always deciding one's destiny. I had to wait while the bootmakers made me a new pair of marching boots. What a line. Internecine political struggles, I'll spare you, led to a few days of bloody street fighting in Barcelona, after which Orwell eventually ships back out to the front. Shortly thereafter, he is shot and is evacuated to the rear where his wounds are treated, he is declared medically unfit, and he is discharged from malicious service, eventually returning to Barcelona yet again. Unbeknownst to him, his political party had been outlawed and he was now a wanted man. Many of those he fought with in the trenches had been imprisoned, and after an uncomfortable few days dodging the authorities, Orwell and his wife, along with some of their English comrades, managed to escape across the frontier into France. No sooner had they done so did they have a yearning to return. It sounds like lunacy, but the thing that both of us wanted to, be, to do was be back in Spain. Both of us wished that we had stayed to be in prison along with the others. I suppose I have failed to convey more than a little of what those months in Spain mean to me. I have recorded some of the outward events, but I cannot record the feeling they have left with me. It is all mixed up with the sights, smells, and sounds that cannot be conveyed in writing. The smell of the trenches, the mountain dog stretching away into inconceivable distances, the frosty crackle of bullets, the roar and glare of bombs, the clear cold light of the Barcelona mornings, and the stamp of boots in the barrack yard, back in December when people still believed in the revolution. What do you believe in? Is there a cause you believe in so fully as to risk dying for it? Of his time in revolutionary Spain, Orwell writes, there was no boss class, no menial class, no beggars, no prostitutes, no lawyers, no priests, no bootlicking, no cap touching. I was breathing the air of equality. This was made possible, or well posits, by the kind of effort that could probably only be made by people who were fighting with revolutionary intention, i.e. believed that they were fighting for something better than the status quo. Anyone who considers themselves a romantic will find much romance in these pages, despite the endless descriptions of trench squalor and filth. To live, and perhaps to die for a person, for a group, for a cause greater than oneself, what could be more romantic than that? The best things about this book are what Orwell writes about, the experiences of an idealistic journalist turned freedom fighter, essentially the coolest thing I can think of, and the style in which he writes it in, dry, clipped, minimalistic, expressive, impassive, and detailed. Orwell is a master, a master of form, of feel, of action, of word, of deed, of thought, of spirit, of willpower, of empathy, a man who did what was necessary, observed without judgment, lived to tell the tale, and was unafraid to do so without needing to embellish. Some of us talk about it, some of us live it. Orwell talked about it, lived it, then wrote about it so as to bring us back there with him. He was there to be and to write. He showed us what he did to show us who he was, <clears throat> and in doing so, allowed us to find ourselves, our true selves, honest, driven, flawed, and selfless in him. May we all find a cause worth fighting for.